Hey, Homegoings fam, Myra here. Did you know that over half of Vermont Public's funding comes from our local community? It's true. The generosity of listeners like you is what powers Homegoings to be able to explore all of the Black experience. From what it feels like to be biracial to the sound of grief, your support makes our show possible. Right now, when you become a monthly donor at $12 or more, we'll thank you with a $25 gift card to spend at the Vermont Public Merch Store. We've got a pretty rad Homegoings crew neck sweatshirt available, just saying. Head to vermontpublic.org slash donate to become a monthly donor today to help support the show. As always, you are welcome here. Depending on where you get your greens from, you especially if you're growing it yourself, you're going to have to really like make sure it's clean. It can also attract a lot of bugs. And so like you would there's times even from the grocery store, I'd find greens. That this is a little slice of a conversation I had with Harmony Adonsawan back in August of last year. We had the idea at the time to follow one soul food recipe through geography and generations. And the recipe we chose was collard greens. Something Harmony, founder of Soul Food Pop-Up, Harmony's Kitchen, is particularly expert at cooking. Trust me, we got to try them. Okay, I made it with smoked turkey today. <laughs> There's a lot of pot liquor, so I don't want to spill it. <laughs> but yeah, oh, actually, I, have... I try it every turn yeah. to eat Harmony's food. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Where's the heat coming from? Oh, it's like like red pepper flakes. As a refresher, in case you haven't had the pleasure, collard greens are a soul food side dish that don't get cooked often. But when they do, you know. Usually by the smell first, since they can take a whole day, if not days, to cook. And an especially cool thing about greens is that everyone seems to cook them a little differently, depending on your generation, your ethnic roots, where you came from. And these ingredients, the ones behind the soul food maker is what made me want to chat with Harmony in the first place. Her eclectic blend of culture makes for some eclectic greens. I call it Afrofusion soul food. It's my particular style of what I do. It's because it's like a kind of like a mix of different African diasporic countries. So I do Southern food, um, a mix of Puerto Rican food and Nigerian food. We're going to share this episode, How Do You Cook Your Greens, again today in honor of the holidays to come and all the cooking they will require. And as a bonus, I caught up with Harmony to hear about what's changed for her, her business, and her greens since the episode came out last year. So... Don't call it a rerun. Call it a remix. Here's my catch up with Harmony. You're one of those people that I I know I have zero doubts that you're going to continue advancing like any gifts that you have forward. Um, because if, if I recall right, when we interviewed you, you were hearkening back to your your very humble beginnings with your business, slinging soul food out of your dorm room. And then since then, right, of course, you started Harmony's Kitchen. I want to know what's going on with the business now. Where's, where's Harmony's Kitchen and how's Harmony doing? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Right now, Harmony's Kitchen, um, I entered into a business development program. I was um, applied to this, you know, really cool program through Goldman Sachs. It's called One Million and One Black Women in Business. And the whole initiative is to kind of invest in black women businesses. Yeah, what we got was a a 10 week um, intensive um, business development program where we were taught from some of the top NYU um, professionals. So I essentially became a student at NYU, the NYU Stern Business School. They, you know, they fly us out for orientation and like, you know, we're learning from all these like amazing people and like being able to like meet so many amazing people. Um, So what we really got was like resources um, and um, turning all those resources into like how we can like actually grow our businesses. Um, So I'll be going to my graduation in two weeks, actually, back in New York. I'm at the Goldman Sachs headquarters, so it's really exciting. (laughs) So with all that is 
going on for you and just watching your ambition and your star continue to rise. What are you doing for self-care and what do you have to offer for other Black women who are starting their own businesses and maybe need to figure out that work-life balance thing, the soul in the soul food, you know? I really try to have a work-life balance. Like, I feel like that's really something important to me. And, you know, when I first started my business, I put the business before me, like it was Harmony's Kitchen and then it was me, you know? Now it's like, you know, I'm, I come before my business, you know? You know, Harmony comes before Kitchen, technically in the name. So I gotta, I gotta do that. And um, figuring out things that I like to do outside of work. It's like I've been modeling more, which has been fun. I've always wanted to model. And I just never really did it because like I've been so focused on my on building up my business. And I've just been doing that more. I got a new puppy randomly. <laughs> Marty McFly, I call him. I'm also, you know, entering a pageant. I'm I'm running for Miss Vermont randomly also, which is fun. So currently I'm serving as Miss Chittenden County. That's my local title. Um and through this position, I'm able to like volunteer and give back to my community in a way that I haven't been able to before. Yeah, just like being able to like do different things and not like the business is important and growing the business is important, but it's not more important than um, the pleasures of life. Congratulations. Oh, my goodness. So we have to talk greens. When it comes time for the holidays, how do you cook your greens? Do you cook them differently? Is it the same? Have you tried anything new lately? My, so the way I cook my drink, my greens are still pretty much the same, except I've um, I've been cooking greens a lot more. I feel like since um, we last talked, um, it kind of really made me want to include it in my menu more on like a consistent basis. Because um, before when I was doing my takeout, um, you know, I usually have my proteins, my fried chicken, baked mac, honey glazed cornbread, and I would have like Cajun green beans. But since we talk now, it's just a regular collard greens. It's just, you know, that's what we do now. <laughs> wait, so, so wait, this, uh, this episode we did together made you want to cook more greens? Literally, yeah. And it, because like so many people also were just like talking about, like they, they love the episode. And like, so like hearing about it and like, I was like, and it, um, doing that episode really made me sit down, I feel like even more with you know, greens and like how special it is. And yeah, so I was like, I want to offer this more. And then hearing from my customers how much they love my greens. You know, they love the Cajun green beans too, but there's just something about collard greens that really makes you feel like you're having a a nice Southern dinner. If we were to do this episode again and highlight another universal soul food that speaks to all regions, all Black folks everywhere, and it were to be called, how do you cook your what? What would it be? What would that thing be for you? I feel like it would be, it would have to be baked mac and cheese. And I feel like it's because when so many different cultures does it differently, like I don't, we don't really have a mac and cheese in Nigeria or anything like that, but there's like a Haitian mac and cheese. Jamaicans have their own way that they make their mac and cheese, African-Americans and Southerners, and just the rich history of mac and cheese too. Like being that mac and cheese was invented by an enslaved um, African person here in, in, here in the South, you know? Um, so I think that would be fun. How do you make your mac and cheese? No, I think mac and cheese, mac and cheese is a good one because it's like, do you use the like evaporated milk? Do you not? Is it cream of mushroom soup? Is it not? Yeah. Do you do a roux? Do you not do a roux? Like, you know, do you do it stovetop? Do you bake it? You know, it's like a whole thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Totally. Well, thank you, Harmony. Thanks so much. We won't call it a rerun. We'll call it a remix. And we're so happy to catch up with you. Good luck on everything. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. From Vermont Public, this is Homegoings. I'm Myra Flynn. Today on the show, a remix of an episode from season one we called How Do You Cook Your Greens, where we follow one soul food recipe across generations. I don't remember her ever using a measuring cup. I don't ever remember mama using a a measuring cup. Cultures. So I'm Nigerian American. So growing up, um, you know, I started cooking when I was like maybe like nine or 10. And it was like me and my sister's responsibility to cook for the family and history. Sometimes you can taste your ancestors in certain things that you cook. You can taste them. This is Homegoings. Welcome home. Mm 
Hey, I'm Anita Rao, and I host a show called Embodied from WUNC. It's an exploration of topics related to sex, relationships, and health. I'm a journalist who understands that conversations about these themes can be intimidating. And that's why I'm here to lead the way. Join me each week to explore important questions about our bodies and society where nothing is off limits. We'll talk about everything from what it's like to be a caregiver to a loved one with dementia, to how folks with disabilities are disproportionately affected by climate change. Find Embodied from WUNC wherever you get your podcasts. And to the best of our knowledge, we're curious about everything. I found a post from a gentleman named John who said, I just found out that my great-great-grandfather had a black son. Did you know that the G's came from France? Really? Wait a minute. This is my grandfather's grandfather. That's how the discussion began. To the best of our knowledge, the show that makes your world bigger. Join us. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, Mama. Hey. (laughs) How's it over there in Brookfield? (laughs) Well, it's, you know, now we have all these mosquitoes because of the standing water. Ugh. So that's, Ah. (laughs) I know. This is my mom, a.k.a. Martha Mathis, Mama Mathis, or if you attended Middlebury College or Norwich University in Vermont, you know her as Dean Mathis. My mom is a 73-year-old Black female retired dean of a military college living in rural Vermont. In short, She's a badass, and I don't think it's the last time we'll hear from her, if I can get her to agree to coming back on the show, that is. My mother is the reason I've had access to my blackness. I grew up in a very white state, Vermont, and I have a white father, but my mom made sure I knew who I was and all the rich black history that I came from. And one of the ways she kept blackness alive in our house was through cooking. So for today's episode, I'm narrowing in on one dish in particular. I'm ready whenever you are. Well, I just, uh, I'm making an episode called How Do You Cook Your Greens? <laughs> I love that title. I love it. You yeah. like it? <laughs> well, I'm, I think that's a, that's a good topic because everybody's different. My mom gets it right away. Collard greens are a soul food side, which don't get cooked often. But when they are cooking, you know. I always knew mm-hmm. greens were being cooked because they smelled <laughs> so good and they were strong in the house. Well, the same way you woke up was the way I woke up. You know, uh, either Miss Carby or Mama deciding to make greens for a specific occasion. There are a lot of different foods that live in the black soul food category. Catfish, fried chicken, mac and cheese, hot watered cornbread, or my mom's personal favorite, what she calls the star of the show, black eyed peas. But I'm thinking collard greens are the star of this show because like my mom says, everyone seems to cook them a little differently, depending on your generation, your ethnic roots, and where you're from. You could ask different people from the South, West Coast, Florida, with the whole Miami, Asian peoples. So this is, this is exciting. I'm anxious to see how different people cook their greens. If you haven't had what we're calling greens, here are the cliff notes. Greens are typically cooked in the biggest pot you have on the stove for hours and hours, sometimes even days. Inside that pot is a kind of soupy broth made from all the other stuff that goes into the recipe. Sometimes that's smoked or salted meats that break down slowly in the greens. There's butter, salt, bones at times, all sorts of spices. So at a certain point to call them greens feels a little like a misnomer. Once you're done putting all that meat in them and cooking them down, there typically isn't much green left. How much butter do you use? I probably use a, 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 you know, a stick. A whole stick of butter. (laughs) Well, yeah. The more high blood pressure, the better. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Now, you, not in every pot, but let's just say you were to decide, okay, I want, I want the pork family. Then that would be salt pork and ham hocks. That's it. You want the smoke family? I would probably still throw in a little 
salt pork because that's where you're getting your flavor along with the parts, the wings or the whatever, the smoked parts. And parts now, you can, oh, they look so good at the store, pretty expensive though out here. But uh, smoked breast, they look so good. <laughs> As much as I loved, adored, and salivated and looked forward to soul food in my home, it didn't come around all that often. So when it did, I knew something big was going down. Well, the purpose for greens is almost like celebratory. So something big is happening. <laughs> if it was a holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, those three in particular. My mom also says greens show up on what she calls the black holidays, which I'm starting to learn means days of labor recognition, freedom recognition, and really any good day to have a barbecue. All the black holidays too, like parades, and Labor Day, uh, Memorial Day weekend, those were all barbecue holidays. Fourth of July. When my mom was making greens in our house, she nearly disappeared into the kitchen for a couple days. You better be bleeding if you were going to interrupt her. It's labor intensive. You've got to wash every every leaf, you know, um, and then you let it soak, and then you wash it again just to get the dirt out, and then you get you know you break it up. Some people chop it. I've just always torn mine so that they come out looking like who they are, <laughs> which is not a, you know, a perfect shape. This is one of those generational dishes. So you're not just going to wake up one day and probably say, hmm, I think, you know, I think I'm going to cook some greens. <laughs> because there's a whole mood involved in it. Because I'll be cussing. I, um, I cuss at a funeral at church. You cussed at church? Hell yeah, the pastor was taking too long. I was like, God damn, I gotta go to a damn game. Me and him cussing each other out at the damn thing? Shit. First, of, I was pissed. First of all, the church had a cover charge, so I was already mad about that, you know. Free to get in, $30 to get out. So that pissed me off, so I cussed him out. It's a joke, I'm joking. <laughs> You got me. Because I'm, I'm sitting here like, what church are you going to? You should not go to that church anymore. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> this is Kevin Bledsoe. And when he's not busy messing with people, he's a celebrity pit master and owner of Bledsoe's Bar and Q restaurants that span California, Texas, and Australia. He's also been a judge on Netflix's TV series, The Barbecue Showdown. Now that's fire. This is Barbecue Showdown. Woo! This is a surf and turf challenge, everybody. Oh. And Kevin has some other notable feathers in his cap, to say the least. You have to say it. It's too much for like I'm bragging. You know, James Beard Award, uh, multiple TV shows, get to work with Phil all the time. You know, that type of stuff. Those type of relationships, just, just a lot. A lot, a lot has came out of it, you know. I met Kevin through my husband, Phil, who I introduced you to in the last episode of Homegoings about black men. Phil works in the bar and restaurant and TV scene, so Kevin is a peer of sorts. I've only ever met him once, so we're still sussing out one another's soul food origins. Phil and I grew up in Vermont. Vermont 54th down there in South Simpson? Y'all from rolling no. 60s? No, Vermont the state, the state. Oh, with the syrup. <laughs> Yes. Only two blacks of Vermont. Y'all probably the only blacks I know from Vermont. Kevin may not know where I'm from, but I know where he's from. Kevin is originally from Compton, California, a place known for a lot of things. Barbecue doesn't come first to mind when I think of it. So Compton, California is where you learned barbecue? Uh, no, I learned barbecue in Texas. Uh, coming out here in the, uh, learned the barbecue game, coming out here in the summertime, spending time with my uh, granny, Miss Willie Mae Fields in Corsicana, Texas. But I learned a little bit in Compton. We barbecue in Compton. What the hell, Myra? You don't think we cook in Compton? I don't know. I just don't know if it's known for its barbecue as much. My, the, you know, quick history. My dad was a LAPD. My mom was a uh, worked at the post office, but she was also a Black Panther sympathizer. So imagine that. You know, of course, they got divorced. But uh, every summer, my mother would send me out because I wanted to go, you know, because I was a country boy at heart. So she sent me out here to Texas every summer.
my granny ran a small, you know, like juke joint, barbecue stand, whole house, uh, bootleg, all that in there was going on at granny's spot. You know, she was one of the best people that I ever seen on the pit, you know, and uh, that's where I learned the barbecue from her. Kevin is what's known as a pit master, which means that when it comes to barbecue, he's in charge of the meat, in particular, the smoking, which I tried recently with a brisket. It took 12 hours and shifts throughout the night. They don't call him a pit master for nothing. Plus, like any journey toward a job or calling, it has its pitfalls. That's right, pun intended. But that wasn't always the plan. Swerving so out, I wasn't going to no food service. I hated it. I hated working in that hot restaurant. Uh, uh, I hated working with my uncles and them. And my granny used to always tell me, uh, uh, well, you need to go to college and get you a degree. Uh, and do something like that. She said, because you are run your own business. Cause she said, you too much of an asshole to work for anybody. And that's what she used to tell me. So I did left. I, and then I went, I was going to teach. So I, I was, uh, going to school for secondary education and I didn't have no lawfully damn goals about being no teacher. I just wanted, I couldn't imagine not having weekends in the summer and holidays off. And that was the only reason I wanted to teach. And then I realized, shit, I hate kids. I don't want to be no teacher. Just went and took tests everywhere. Uh, Dallas PD, LAPD, LA Sheriff Department of Corrections, and uh, Department of Corrections came through. Uh, so it's, I graduated college that Thursday. That Monday, I was in the Corrections Academy in Sacramento, California, just that quick. My granny was right, I got fired. And uh, uh, being an asshole, but uh, I had to fall back on what I knew. And even then, I still didn't want to go. But Granny, one of her sayings was, you got to always have you a legal hustle. Kevin spent the next dozen or so years working for the California Department of Corrections. And surprisingly, that helped prepare him for his next gig. Yeah, you got to run that kitchen like a prison kitchen. That kitchen is the clean prison kitchen, the cleanest uh, uh, kitchen around, you know, so you run that kitchen. It's like that. But just... Discipline, the discipline of it, you know, because I thought when I got terminated, I was the worst day of my life. But like I say, you like I tell my kids, you never know how your life is going to be. You never know. You might think this is the road for you. And like I say, that was the only way God forced me out of that because he had such a bigger plan. And I was just comfortable. You know, I was comfortable making seven, eighty thousand dollars a year. I'm young. You know what I mean? And he was like, no, nah, partner, you, I, you got some work ahead of you. Kevin's food at Bloodsoe's Bar and Q is bomb. Trust me, I've eaten there a bunch. The menu includes things like hush puppies with chipotle buttermilk, loaded fries with buffalo chicken, pulled pork, and brisket on them, an entire menu section entitled Meat, and of course, the recipe du jour. Can you talk to me about greens? Oh, I love collards. Being with my granny, the reason why collard greens are so big in restaurants and things like that is because they hold up better. The the turnip greens and the uh yeah, mustard greens, they get they if you know how they when they sit in the water, they get real like swampy. So collards always stand up, you know, because it's, it's a bigger leaf, it's a stronger leaf, and all that. So my granny, when I would come to Texas, would cook collards, and collards was just so strong. And to get that leaf to where you want it, because it's a, it's the toughest one out of all of them, it's the strongest one out of all of them. The elephant ears get the biggest out of all of them, and it's the most flavorful out of all of them, and it's the most hardest one to cultivate, you know, out of all of them. So, and that, that's like I said, and that was a throwaway green or a throwaway plant or whatever for slaves and stuff too back in the days. What Kevin says here is important because you can dress it up, make it a trend, or write a cookbook about it. But in the end, this delicious food we now know as soul food comes from slavery. All this food was throwaway food. So brisket is the, the most popular dish probably in barbecue, you know, especially in competition. And that's actually the uh, chest of the, the cow, which is the toughest muscle. Uh, that's what we were given to cook with as slaves. Uh, the worst parts of the pig, the feet, the chitlins and, and all that, the, you know, the guts, the tail, the nose, all the worst parts our ancestors was given to cook with. And they and look what they did. They made it amazing. Mm. 
we, slaves, black people, took these undesirable parts, scraps, leftovers, and inedible things, and with a whole lot of love, turned them into beautiful food. And not just because we had to, though there were no other options, but because of what we already knew how to do. Though the collard greens recipe we know now did not originate in Africa, the tradition of eating greens are really most things that have been cooked down into a low gravy and drinking that gravy from the greens, known as a pot liquor, is of African origin. So we brought this style of cooking to the plantation and wouldn't you know, it spread. When slaves entered the plantation houses as official cooks, their African style of cooking merged with the foods available in the region they lived in and began to evolve into what is now writ large, just called Southern cooking. There has been a recent movement in the soul food world to make soul food healthier. I know my mom said it earlier, the higher the blood pressure, the better. But real talk, studies like the one by the Journal of the American Medical Association show that fried foods and fats could be why black people disproportionately suffer from hypertension. A diet high in fat and sodium can lead to high blood pressure with risk factors like heart attacks, strokes, and kidney disease. I can name at least three of my own family members who have diabetes. But Kevin says, don't blame the food. A lot of people talk negative about it, but just think, how can you talk negative from people that you came from and that's all they had to eat and they ate it so you don't have to eat it. You didn't have to eat it. But now you still eat it because you realize some of it is still incredible food. I mean, I remember they used to talk about oxtails on uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. Granny would say, they'll say, what you couldn't, we having uh, oxtails and crow's feet. And now look, oxtails, I mean, I, I still got a paper somewhere where from the 70 something where the oxtails were like uh, 69 cents a pound. Now they like $15 a pound, you know, because like I said, they love that food. They love your food. They loved it when you was a slave because you was cooking it for them and they love it now. Now we just getting paid for it. Within this movement to make soul food healthier, I've seen everything from gluten-free fried chicken recipes to vegan collard greens. We aren't slaves anymore and we don't want our people dying. So I get it. But you have to ask where you draw that line in keeping or changing one of the only early traditions Black Americans have to hold on to, really claim, and actually profit off of. I mean, growing up with soul food was a true inroad to me knowing my history, to me knowing myself. And Kevin says, the real new ingredient in soul food these days is choice. It's a privilege to get to abandon that tradition at all. Now you have the choice to eat what you want to eat. You know, then you had a choice. To eat. That's all we had to eat. And we made it incredible. So I, I feel like it should be celebrated all the time, you know, and, and I'm, I fight for it all the time. I mean, I think probably right. People are down on soul food because of how many of us have diabetes. Who eats it every single day, especially in, if you got diabetes, you're going you're gonna to have diabetes. You ain't cooking soul food every day. You cook a spaghetti and everything else. You're not making oxtail. It's no black person I know that's eating a soul food dinner every single day. Just keep it 100. Okay. It's not. You. It's like you, oh, what you cooking this Wednesday, honey? What you cooking? I'm cooking some short ribs, oxtails, string beans, banana pudding. You're not eating like that during the week, you know? You know that you have a hamburger helper throughout the week and ain't nothing healthy about that. So ain't no soul food gave you no diabetes. That damn Taco Bell and all that gave you diabetes. I get so damn tired when they try to put soul food down. And I'll be like, what genre of food is healthy? None. So why do we always talk about our food? I love soul food. I love our culture. I love where it comes from. I mean, we took nothing and made it into something. Sometimes you can taste your ancestors in certain things that you cook. You can taste them, you know, so you can taste like the pain and all the, oh, spice that up, spice that up. I want that to be hot like so-and-so, so-and-so. You can taste all that. No other culture has went through what we had to, to go through. So soul food is ours. Hey, homies, Myra here. And now that season two of Homegoings is all wrapped up, 
it's the perfect time for us to do some reflecting and ask, how are we doing? And what should we do next? These are the questions we're hoping you can help us answer. If you head over to homegoings.co, you'll find an online survey asking you for your feedback. And we want it all. What matters most to you? What do you want to hear next? What events would you like to attend? Who's missing in our coverage? By filling out the survey, you'll help shape our podcast so we can keep up this humanizing work of sharing brown and black stories. It only takes five minutes. We timed it. So head over to homegoings.co and let us know what you think. As an extra treat, filling out this survey automatically enters you into a drawing for a dope Homegoings crew neck sweatshirt. And who doesn't want a little merch? Am I right? Thank you for sticking with us through two seasons of the show. There's more to come. And as always, you are welcome here. Okay, I made it with smoked turkey today. <laughs> There's a lot of pot liquor, so I don't want to spill it. <laughs> but yeah, oh, actually, I have. I try it every turn. Yeah. To be, eat Harmony's food. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Really Where's is. the heat coming from? Oh, it's like, like it. red pepper flakes. But what do you think of the collard greens? I'd say, honestly, they're good. The The way the spices and the way the, like, juices and the greases just kind of soak into the greens <laughs> just gives it that extra taste to it. Thank you. <laughs> That's so yeah, sweet. It's no problem. That's my little corner Ramsey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like layers of flavor, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is Harmony Adosuan. Um, I live in Winooski, Vermont, and I am a private chef and caterer. Um, you know, just doing my thing, making soul food. How's it going? Harmony Adosawan is the chef and owner of Harmony's Kitchen, a soul food catering company and supper club. And as you can hear, her food is being thoroughly enjoyed in studio without me because I work remotely. Though I've been promised some were frozen for my return. In Vermont Public, I'm holding y'all to that. Anyway, Harmony's Kitchen, the business, came into view for Harmony in 2019. But the concept for it began long before that. I knew that there wasn't really a lot of authentic black soul food here. And so I started it because I was like, you know, I want to be able to bring that here. Also to make extra money. I was in college when I was doing it. I was like a junior in college. So I was like cooking out of my apartment. I lived with like five other people. And um, <laughs> I would make these advertisements and like my classmates would come and pick up food in my humble apartment. And so that's kind of like how I got my origins. And so through that process of like, building up my business, I started to like just deeply fall, like grow more of like a passion for what I was doing. I've had the chance to taste Harmony's food at different events over time. And just like the big, beautiful Afro she is rocking in studio today, it stands out. There's something familiar, yet also totally different about her food, a style you can taste that's all her own. I call it Afrofusion soul food is my particular style of what I do. It's because it's like a kind of like a mix of different African diasporic countries. So I do Southern food, um, a mix of Puerto Rican food and Nigerian food. So I'm Nigerian American. So growing up, um, you know, I started cooking when I was like maybe like nine or 10. And it was like kind of my responsibility me and my sister's responsibility to cook for the family. That's kind of just like how the culture is a little bit, you know, like a lot of the responsibility is put on to um, the kids. And so um, my mom from a young age would make me like stand next to her and just watch her cook um, whenever. Like she was like, just come stand next to me, watch me do this. Southern food I learned kind of mostly through different friends and um, different families and online as well. Um, there's like a great resource of um, learning, but whenever I go online and try to learn something, I always try to make sure it's coming from like an authentic source, you know? And Puerto Rican food I learned mostly from, I grew up in the Bronx. The Bronx is a very diverse place. There's like a bunch of different cultures, especially like there's a bunch of different Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. And so I had one friend in particular, um, her mom actually taught me how to make um, a lot of the Puerto Rican food I make today. Mm -hmm. 
Throughout reporting this episode, I've gotten a deeper understanding as to why some foods were undesirable for slave masters and why they made it to the soul food menu. Mostly, they were things that were hard to eat, but I'll admit, greens still trip me up a little. They do take a long time to prepare, but you gotta wonder how anything green made the cut. They aren't as hard to eat as, say, a neck bone of an animal. Harmony has some theories. Well, usually when people see collard greens, they see it all cleaned and put in the store, like all bunched up for you, wrapped up, right? But when you're actually growing the plant, it's actually a very dirty process. And greens are like, especially fresh greens, like straight from the ground are extremely dirty. And so I can see why that would turn, um, I guess, rich folks of the time off. Like it's not really something that they would see worth getting their hands dirty for. And it's such like a rigorous process. Depending on where you get your greens from, you especially if you're growing it yourself, you're going to have to really like make sure it's clean. It can also attract a lot of bugs. And so like you would... There's times even from the grocery store, I'd find greens that still have bugs in them, you know? And so like, you really have to be really, you have to pay attention. This isn't something that you can like, you know, do lazily. <laughs> like if you're gonna make greens, clear your day and make sure that, you know, you had the time to do it. Before Harmony became an entrepreneur, she was an activist at the University of Vermont and in her town of Winooski. And from what I've seen over the years in following her, she was a passionate one. It's no surprise to me that in switching gears to being a chef, her food reflects that same passion. Before I started doing Harmony's Kitchen, I was, I was more so known for, you know, being a poet and activist. And so I spent, literally since I came here in 2016 till 2021, all those years, just full force activism, activism, activism. And... I had to step away because I was just like, you know, I'm not finding joy in life. It's sucking everything out of me. I'm really trying to make this place a better place for Black folks and a better place for, you know, us to live, whether when I was on UVM campus, trying to make it a better place for minorities and then being out in the community, trying to make it a better place for all people. But I guess stepping away and finding that joy I took a year, I thought it was gonna be a year off from activism, but I'm still off from it. But I kind of like took that time in 2021 and 2022 to kind of find out like, what is it like to not fight anymore? What is it like to not have to keep going at this? What is it like to like try to live a life that's softer, you know? And then I started, I started cooking, cooking, I guess. guess. Here on the show, each of our episodes ends with a deep listen to something powerful and profound. Sometimes that's art, and as you heard in our last episode on Black men, sometimes that's just something amazing someone says. I'll admit, in this episode, I've been burying the lead a little. So for this deep listen, we are going to circle back to my mom, Martha Mathis, Kevin Bloodsoe, and Harmony Adolsamon, and hear how they cook their greens, scored to the sound of Harmony cooking her famous greens. So sit back and let the listen in. And as a nod to what Kevin said earlier, I'm going to title this one, Tasting My Ancestors. You know, we would... Um Clean the, cook the night before, of course, for the the big days. Uh, you didn't you didn't do all this cooking the same day that you wanted to eat it. There's no time. I basically make a vinegar wash bath. Um, I'm looking through all my greens. I submerge them into the water for like maybe like 20 to 30 minutes. Let it do its thing there. You take each leaf one by one, rinsing it with cold water, checking it for any more dirt or like bugs or anything like that. Once that's all done, you put it to the side. Cut your collard greens. Don't put them in holes, strip them. Cut them in strips, roll them and cut them in strips. They cook better. The, the broth gets through better on them than, than when you have them and it looks like damn uh, banana leaves or something. Cut them up, cut them in strips and, and, and they'll cook way much better. I just tore them. I didn't. You know, I got the, the stems off because they're tough. Now, Mama's 
grains were a lot different than Miss Carvey's grains. So that's where I learned uh, ham hock. I learned all that from Miss Carvey, ham hock, neck bones. After that, you know, you um, saute some onions, some, some garlic, um, any seasonings you like, and um, you, once that's done, you add some chicken broth. When that reaches a, a boil with, at that point, you should add maybe like a smoked turkey leg or like ham. I do smoked turkey leg because I just don't really eat pork like that. Um, but some folks like, you know, the pork in there. And so that's totally fine. If I'm using ham hocks or turkey wings, uh, I, I uh, boil those. I, I bring those up to, to get those tender because I think the biggest mistake that people do is to put a ham hock, a smoked ham hock or a smoked turkey wing in there to cook with the greens because I want the meat to come off of it. So the, you have to, greens don't take that long to cook, 45 minutes to an hour. So your meat has to already kind of be breaking down so that last hour while it's cooking into the greens, it's going to break down into the greens. Other than that, you're just going to have a big old tough ham hock sitting on top of some greens. We never threw it in, but Miss Carvey would throw in uh, okra. I remember eating her greens and she'd have okra. And th those are good too, to put in there. And then I take a little bit of the broth, because it gets real salty, but I take a little bit of that and I add that into the green, the, the juice that I'm putting my greens in. And I cook my greens with chicken base. Uh, sometimes I use a pork jowl, sometimes I don't. Ham hock uh, or a turkey wing, a smoked turkey wing, onions, garlic, uh, crushed red peppers, all that. Cook, cook that down. That simmering process can take up to an hour um, just to get the greens at a nice consistency. Your broth has to already taste good. You have to build your flavors by your broth. You know what collard greens taste like. So you build your flavor. When you taste that and it tastes like a soup, and it's good, that's when it's time to put the greens in there. When you bring that to a boil, you add the greens. Essentially, pot liquor is just that, that juice that comes from that fusion of the greens and the chicken broth you put in um, during the cooking process. So it just creates like just this delicious, um, such a unique like broth. Um, when I was actually on my way here, I was like in my Uber with my pan and like pot liquor juice was just falling everywhere. But I'm like, it smells so good, I'm sure. They're not gonna mind. I cleaned it up though, but. <laughs> so by that time you're, you're exhausted and it's time to go to bed. <laughs> so there's my story. You can taste your ancestors in certain things that you cook. You can taste them, you know? So you can taste like the pain and all oh, the, oh, spice that up, spice that up. I want that to be hot, like so-and-so, so-and-so. It feels really ancestral, like just ripping the collard greens with your hands and like putting it to the side. And like, I just felt like so like connected. There are two women that come to my mind whenever I think of these. So that's Mama and Miss Kirby. And um, yeah, they, yeah. So I, you know, I don't know much else as, as far as how far back I should know. But when I think about cooking greens, I do think about those two. This conversation I think is worthy of production <laughs> because you are talking, I do, because you're talking generational. And without that, well, you know, there will always be greens. Thanks so much for listening to Homegoings, a righteous space for art and race. It's been a pleasure being here with you. Special thanks to Jay Green and Phil Wills, also to Kim Carson, Brendan Carson, and Scott Finn for eating some of Harmony's greens on the mic. Or should I say, you're welcome. And as per usual, thanks to Elodi Reed, who is the graphic artist behind all of our Homegoings artist portraits. Harmony and her greens are front and center on this one, so be sure to check her out at homegoings.co. This episode was mixed, scored, and reported by me, Myra Flynn, with support from our associate producer, James Stewart. 
I also composed the theme music. Other music by Blue Dot Sessions and Jay Green. Brittany Patterson edited this episode, and James Stewart contributes to so many things on the back end of making this thing come to life. So, how do you cook your greens? The people need to know, and by people, I mean me. Do you have a family greens or soul food recipe that's been passed down to you? Or maybe a recipe that you've innovated and made your own? We want it all. Write to us at hey at homegoings.co. While you're there, you can sign up for our bi-monthly newsletter and give us a follow on Instagram at we are homegoings. See you in two weeks for another something cool dropped into our feed. As always, you are welcome here. Every episode of Brave Little State begins with a question about Vermont that's been submitted and voted on by listeners like you. What happened to all the restaurant workers? What's the deal with Vermont's fire towers? Why do people like the band Fish? Follow Brave Little State wherever you get podcasts. From Vermont Public, part of the NPR Network.